Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms, and today we're not going to talk about the Wuhan Corona Baofeng virus. We're going to talk about antennas. The antennas we're going to talk about today are all contained in this bag, and specifically we're going to talk about a do-it-yourself project to make your own HF antenna that I have contained in here. Now, typically these antennas reside in the same container as my FT817, and they aren't strictly limited to this particular radio. You can also use them with the radio with a considerable power. These are the contents of my antenna bag laid out for display. This is a VHF UHF roll-up J-pole antenna. I have a video on my channel on how to make this yourself. And this is a UHF ultralight ground plane. I also have a video on my channel for that. I have two 35 foot sections of RG58 size 50 ohm feed line terminated with PL259s and with BNC connectors on the other side of it. So that gives me some flexibility and also I carry enough couplers to uh, join it from either end. And it's nice to have a lot of feed line if you need it. Uh, it just also gives me the ability if I want to reduce weight, I can leave behind one section of feed line. But in this configuration here, it allows me the luxury of being able to operate VHF and UHF antennas simultaneously in perhaps two different radio systems and support that operation with what I have on hand. This right here is the contents of my accessory bag. I have a 62 foot in-fed HF antenna and this is the 25 foot counterpoise wire for it. Also, I have 25 foot of feed line here and I have a small BNC to PL259 jumper to hook it to my tuner. This tuner is incredibly simple inside. Uh, trying to affect repair of an auto tuner in the field is virtually impossible, whereas something like this is much more feasible. And that is the MTech ZM2 ATU. It's not a bad little tuner, it's a QRP tuner, so you don't want to run, you know, 100 watts through that. Over here we have a collection of RF adapters and I also have a small dummy load here. Now the tuner also has a small low power dummy load built into it. So if I choose to, I could leave that behind, but I always like to have a load for testing. And I have a variety of adapters here, as I've said, for various types of radios that I may be called upon to support. I have a little jumper here, which I can configure to use portable radio of either a male or a female SMA variety with the use of the barrel connector there. And then this little bag contains all of my adapters. Over here, I have my cordage bag. I have a large fishing sinker in here, which is about that size. And 50 foot of 550 cord, it's of a high visibility yellow. So when you're throwing it, you can actually find your line. And then I have some smaller hanks of cordage right here. And now we come to the entree of our video. This is my HF antenna system. My HF antenna system is a full-size antenna. It's not a compromise antenna. It's not some kind of a gimmick. And it's capable of handling whatever power output that the ballon is rated for. I believe this one, this ballon in particular, is either a 200 or 500 watt ballon. And you could certainly build an antenna system such as this that could handle the power of a legal limit amplifier as long as your ballon is rated for that. This particular antenna as displayed is set up for the 80 meter and the 40 meter bands. And it's to be deployed in an invis configuration, which we're going to talk about in a second here. And we're going to give you the details so you can roll one of these antennas for yourself. This is a gross oversimplification of HF radio propagation for the purposes of the video. The earth itself at ground level is here. And then this is what's called the ionosphere. The ionosphere is basically a bunch of free electrons. And these free electrons allow radio waves to propagate at HF radio frequencies. Typically, frequencies in the HF range below the maximum usable frequency are bent back to Earth by the ionosphere once they hit the ionosphere, and then they return to Earth, and they return to Earth at a considerable distance away from the transmission's emanation. And these signals can return back up to the ionosphere and make multiple hops. So our problem here is, is that our signal 
and sky wave propagation is carrying our signal beyond the station that's in this what we call the skip zone here that's our desired contact. Now one way we can establish contact with this individual or pass our traffic is with a network of other stations utilizing a human relay concept which is uh, perhaps the station that's receiving your traffic is also receiving his traffic and rel can relay your traffic or you have individual operators here that can relay the traffic from the position where it's emanating from. Now one way we could enhance our ability to communicate with this desired station that's too close for SkyWave and in our SkyWave skip zone is by the use of an antenna configured as a near vertical incident SkyWave antenna. Now it's important to remember that for this to be most effective you need to have this other desired station also needs to have an antenna that's configured for Invis operation. But the Cliff's notes on the theory is instead of focusing our RF towards the ionosphere in an angle like angled towards the horizon or just above the horizon, we're, at, we're sending our RF straight up as much as possible by lowering our antenna to the ground. In effect, allowing our antenna to use the ground as almost like a reflector is used in a Yagi type of antenna. And what this has the effect of doing is, is instead of skipping the signal off the ionosphere, it's basically scattering it once it hits the ionosphere and the signals are returned to Earth. A good physical model of this phenomenon, to put this into context, is if you were inside of a structure and you were taking a solid board nozzle on a fire hose, for example, and you squirted it towards the ceiling, once it hit the ceiling at this angle here, it would return to earth farther away and it would not impact this particular area right here. Whereas if you took that solid bore nozzle and focused it straight toward the ceiling, you would cause all the droplets to return. Here's some very basic principles of invis antenna theory. Invis antennas typically are low horizontally polarized antennas. And by low I mean mounted low and close to the earth. Transmit and receive antennas, if separate, which is desirable, would be two-tenths of a wavelength for the transmit and the receive antenna one-tenth of a wavelength above the soil. This makes it easier for us because it's easier to put up an antenna lower to the ground than it is higher to the ground. The frequencies used in the HF spectrum are below 10 megahertz and the typical amateur frequencies that are suited to this type of operation are the 75, 60, and 40 meter amateur bands. The kind of ground that you're mounting your antenna over is also important. Farmland is better than desert, for example. Both stations should use Invis antennas, meaning that anybody that's taking advantage of this propagation should utilize an Invis antenna. If you have your antenna configured as an Invis antenna and you're trying to contact another station in that Skywave skip zone, that if they're utilizing a whip antenna, your effectiveness of your talk bath is going to be diminished. Those of you who have watched my channel in the past know that I'm a big fan of rough rule. A rough rule is just a figure that is an average of all of the other numbers that's going to give you an acceptable level of performance. And it's something you can pull out of your hat and apply it and have acceptable performance. When we run all the numbers for the antenna heights, you can see them displayed here. And then average is around 26 feet above ground level. So 25 feet above ground level and a combined transmit and receive in this antenna is going to give you the best of all worlds across those specific frequency bands. But like all things radio, your mileage may vary. And if you have the time and luxury of experimenting with your system, I would encourage you to do so to fine tune your solution. Let's talk about building one of these antennas for yourself. This antenna, for all intents and purposes, is nothing more than a dual band fan dipole with quick detach elements. And because in this instance we're configuring this antenna to utilize lower HF spectrum for Invis operation, doesn't necessarily mean you could not use this for other amateur frequencies in the HF spectrum by just applying your dipole formula and building your elements to the lengths that you want to utilize. Now, if we look here from the top, we can see our RF feed point is a one-to-one -one ballon, and we have our 40-meter dipole here, and then we have our 80-meter dipole here, and they're just crossed in relation to one another to make the antenna easier to deploy. Now, if you just wanted to use 40 meters or just 80 meters, you would just go ahead and, like for 80 meters, you would just delete the 40 meter elements and leave the 80 meter elements. So, if you're going to run it as a single band dipole antenna, you could certainly do so, and that is key to the flexibility of the system. The materials I use to build this antenna 
are as follows. 200 foot of wire. The wire type you select for your antenna needs to be durable, meaning it needs to be a stranded wire, not a solid wire that will break in service. And you can go down to Rural King and buy spools of wire, and that kind of wire will suffice. You know, you could use like a number 22, which is this size wire here. Or what I used for my 40 meter antenna was I have to have a spool of this wire here, which is this is wire that's made to be used as test leads for test equipment. And it's a rubber jacketed wire, and it's very flexible, meaning that it doesn't really take a set and it's easy to spool up on itself. Now, for the 80 meter elements I use WD-1A wire which does take a set so that's the reason why I made those uh, winders out of an old cutting board but whenever you attach this to your insulators or to your swivels for constructing the antenna I just tie a knot. I use a bowline knot which if you know how to tie a bowline uh, you can certainly do so. This is the way I tie it and I'm going to show it to you right now. You start out with about nine inches of wire and Taking it between your thumb and forefinger, you just make a turn, then reach down to your standing end and make another loop. Pass it through that loop you just made and making that loop as small as possible and leaving yourself a lot of tail. You just pull it tight and you have an outside bowl. And now what you can do is, is you can put your uh, power pole connector on this end here. Uh, I use 30 foot of 50 ohm RF coax, which is RG58 is what I used, and I have one PL259 and one BNC male connector on that feed line. 100 foot of cordage for your stakes to tie out your insulators to your stakes. In regards to the 200 foot of cordage that you're going to utilize for this project, take four sections of 18 feet and put them on your stakes right here and that way you have an even amount for each stake and I just store my cordage on my stakes like this you can store it however you desire and I take and perforate the stake and place a bowl and knot securing the cordage to the back side of it now the other sections of cordage that you have left over from your stakes you're going to use to make loops this is our hang loop right here and then these two loops go around the side of the ballon itself and these tie into the fishing swivels to allow element attachment. Now take the balance of your cordage and cut three six inch sections and we're going to go ahead and make our loops for our ballon. Now we're just going to tie simple fisherman knots so essentially make yourself a loop and just tie a simple overhand knot on one side. You can kind of see that there and then on the opposite side do the exact same thing. And this makes for a strong enough loop for our application. A one-to-one -one ballon and the ballon I used was a Diamond Antennas BU like Bravo Uniform 5-0. Four stakes. You can use plastic stakes. You can use aluminum stakes. I use aluminum stakes in my example. Four in end insulators. Your four antenna insulators I make out of drinking water PVC. Just go ahead and cut it to a short length and punch holes in it and then you can see how we have our antenna element pass through with a bowl and knot. Four stainless steel fishing swivels. Now you can see how I've tied our fishing swivels under this loop of cordage on the side of the ballon for our quick detach elements and these are just stainless steel fishing swivels and these are the large ones and these are you know pretty easy to obtain when you're attaching your elements to your antenna you just merely take your bowling loop at the opposite end and attach it to your fishing swivel eight 30 amp power pole connectors you can see in our ballot when we make our electrical connection for our antenna elements we're just using the power pole connectors and you merely just plug it in like that and you want to have enough slack in this pigtail here to allow the antenna to have a range of motion which is not going to cause the elements to become separated. Number 10 ring connectors. 
On our valen, you can see our pigtails that we've constructed, and you can see our ring terminals that I've soldered to the ends of the jumper, and then I've attached those to the ballon and its two connection points that are retained by metric machine screws, like that. So how are we going to deploy our antenna? Before we go outside and look at how I've got it set up, we're going to discuss it. We're going to have it set up in an inverted V fashion. An inver inverted V is merely we're elevating the feed point in relation to the ends of the elements instead of having them parallel with one another as we normally think of in a dipole antenna. That does have an effect on impedance in comparison to having the dipole antenna perfectly parallel. As I showed you before, we do have the elements are crossed in relation to one another and we're using a fiberglass mast to support the ballon and the feed point. We have our feed line here and we have our elements spread out with our insulators at the end and then we're using stakes and cordage to support the antenna and it almost acts as a guy system for the antenna itself to allow it to be able to handle winds. Now you could certainly take the antenna and delete the mast and place, place this on a branch as long as you have room to set the antenna up in that way and that will work fine. But typically Invis antennas exhibit better performance when they're set up in the clear and they don't have any overhead foliage. Here are the antenna set up on a fiberglass push-up pole. You can see the detail of the feed point from the ground level here. Let's go ahead and sweep our antenna. And we can see that the performance is very good in our 80 meter band and the performance is very good in the 40 meter band and not so hot in the 60 meter band. But considering the quick detached nature of the antenna elements, it would be fairly simple just to go ahead and swap out that if I wanted to use a 60 meter band. For last, let's just go ahead and sweep the entire amateur band and see what our performance is going to be like here. And there we have it from 1.5 megahertz through 30 megahertz. I hope this helps. This is Brett from SurvivalCom.